Hello everyone, I'm Brian. Today I'm going to be reacting to what is Mimamsa and Vedanta philosophy. Mimamsa, I believe. I don't know if I said it correctly or not. I question everything I say about in this channel. But anyways, this is the last two of the six major philosophies of Hinduism. I'm a little bit maybe familiar with Vedanta because of Swami, but Mimamsa, I, am, I have no clue on that one. So let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> This is actually a really long one. Namaste everyone, this is Vishwa again. Today I'm going to talk about the last two Indian philosophies called Mimansa and Vedanta. So let's quickly understand what is Mimansa and Vedanta. So Mimansa is very close to what you call it Hindu religion because it more talks about the ritualism, worship, how to perform your duties. But it is categorized as philosophy, so I'm going to focus on that one, though it is the most complex and the longest literature was ever written in form of the sutras. It contained 2,500 sutras, the biggest one out of all six. The Vedanta was written by Sage Vyasa and his student Jaimini wrote this philosophy. So they are kind of related to each other in a student and a teacher relationship. So now I'm going to first focus on Mimansa, what it is, and then same way focus on Vedanta. So Mimansa basically focuses on the earlier part of the Vedas means Vedas has certain portions to be clear the two parts of it one is called Karmakand means focuses on the rituals worship mantras and the other part is only focusing on the knowledge more closely with Upanishads Upanishads are basically about the knowledge these two, Mimansa and Vedanta, in one way or other, doing a major work because studying Veda and clearly understanding certain rituals or knowledge can be very difficult because the same rituals are performed in different ways in different texts. There are four Vedas and each Veda is the same ritual are performed in different ways so it can it created different confusions so Mimansa basically studied all that and did a critical what that's what Mimansa is called critical investigation and brought the understanding that what kind of rituals and how you should perform it it also gave the knowledge about the mantra and the sound system so let's dive into it one by one. These two are kind of distinct from each other. So there will be a hardly any similarity, but except few, which I will point it out. So let's see Mimansa philosophy, the school of ritualism. So what is Mimansa? Mimansa means the critical investigation or reverent thoughts. This philosophy basically deals with your duties. What is the right action, which also called dharma? How to execute your karma to fulfill that dharma? It also deals mainly with sound or mantras. How to apply the rituals to gain the liberation as well. So this philosophy was written somewhere around 400 BC and it is the longest, thickest book ever written containing 2500 sutras. Just imagine the complexity of this work. So now let me share some basic information of Mimansa philosophy. Once the Vedic Yajyas 
or the rituals had fallen into disuse or misuse and they had become increasingly irrelevant in the lives of the people more and more so the Jaimini wanted to bring back the Vedic rituals so he actually covered the two sections of Vedas named Brahmans and Samhitas which deals with right actions Mimansa is also known as Purva Mimansa or Karma Mimansa because it deals with ritual actions and worship. This school is basically the analysis of sound and mantra leading to the rituals. Thus provides a rule for the interpretation of the Vedas and philosophical justification for the observance of Vedic rituals. It reconciles the different directives given in different texts for the same ritual. It is also said that it applies mostly to the householders. It's also known that the great chunk of the Mimansa philosophy is derived from the Naya and Vasheshika Dio. It's important to point it out that Mimansa philosophy also did not accept the existence of God. Even though it came from Veda, it's very interesting that all the names of the God in Veda, Germany says, this is just for the namesake. The power of the gods are in the mantras. Perform the rituals and gain that power through the mantras. <clears throat> yes, I must say, like uh, a figured ritual usually generally deals with the supernatural or God. And it's weird for a, I guess, a philosophy that deals in a lot of rituals and not believe in a god, but it's kind of weird to say that when you perform a ritual, you obtain the power of God. But there, I believe there has to exist a god to obtain that power from. And I'm wondering if this philosophy believes in uh, Atman as well. And maybe that's where you obtain the power by doing the ritual. However, later, this Mimansa philosophy got two sub-schools and one school started to believe or added the God concept. So that's on a high level. So there are many sub-schools in Mimansa theory. However, two are the most well-known. One is Prabhakar Mimansa and the other is the Bhat Mimansa. Both are on the name of the founder. The Prabhakar Mimansa school is an atheist school, it uses first five sources of the knowledge which I talked about in my first video. The Bhatta Mimansa accepts the personal God, so it is theist and uses all the six sources of the knowledge. So is the sixth source the source where you can accept or have personal gods or gods? And is that the reason why, I guess, the, uh, the first school did not accept that sixth source? So to keep the focus directly to the Mimansa philosophy, I will not much go into the sub-schools as they can take a lot more time to explain the differences. Now let's talk about the Mimansa philosophy's main teachings. Some of the top ones are the selfless action, non-attachment, self-control and self-discipline, having a daily schedule and a psychophysical well-being, have the social awareness so that you can contribute in the society, also have a sense of equality Mimansa believes that each individual has something unique to contribute and to have the unity within diversity and be selective because you want to spend your time what is right for you. That's actually pretty good um, to be, um, so let me get, rewind real quick about the diversity portion, have unity within diversity. A lot of people just say, oh, let's let's just have diversity for the sakes of diversity, which is not always a good thing. It's obviously that you want diversity to have many ways of thinking about things, to have many different perspectives. 
the problem with diversity is trying to have unity as well to spend your time what is right for you and yes selective because you don't want to be wasting your time completely agree with those statements also seeing the eternity in the non-eternal world so the basic premise of right action or dharma is more on the ethical aspects of life than the rational and that is the focus which relates to karma as you know normally one is slave to one's duties and actions but when those duties and actions are performed with perfect detachment one becomes their master and is no longer bound to receive their fruit um so this one i, I associate with or how i understood it is basically do everything 110 percent give it all you got but expect nothing from it which is something that I try to do. I've been decently successful at that, but I am not perfect. So of course, there's gonna be times where when I put some effort into something and it doesn't work out, it it, it hurts. But I, again, I try to understand it and then it goes away. <laughs> but then whenever I bring it back up, it's like, ah, oh, I gotta understand it again. I understand that it's in the past, past, and there's nothing I can do about it now, but still, you know, I'm just human. And in reality, in the essence, that is the Karma Yoga. So now I'm going to talk about those four or five major questions, how Mimansa answers that. So in one line, if I have to say about the creation of the world through Mimansa's eye, then the Mimansa is the silent about how it was created, who created, and its process. However, Mimansa believes in the reality of the world with all the countless objects in it. This world comprises the living bodies including the various sense organs. And the souls reside temporarily to reap the effects of their actions. That can be good or bad. The various objects of world serve as the fruits to be suffered or enjoyed. So now let's talk about the Creator or God. Mimansa system says all the materials that make up the physical world are eternally existing. Since the karmas of the souls impel these materials in the process of creation, there is no need to accept any God as the agent of creation. It also states that the names of gods in Vedas are just for the namesake. The actual power of the mantras is the power of gods. However, one of the sub-school, as I mentioned earlier, accepts the concept of personal god. So, see, since karma is the soul impels these materials in the process of creation, there is no need to accept any god as an agent of creation. It states that the names of god and the Vedas are just, <clears throat> are just for the name's sake. The actual power of the mantras is the power of the god, power of gods. That's weird to say to say that the power of the mantras is the power of the gods, indicating that there is a god. When you do the mantras, you invoke the power of god or gods but yet you don't believe in God, or there's no need to accept any God. Well, by saying there's no need to accept any God, it means there is a God, but you don't have to accept them. But it says this is an atheistic um, path. So there should be there is no God, there's no, there is no God as the agent of creation, it's, and you can say this, it states that the name of God and the Vedas are just for the sake of it. You know, just saying like, it's not actually God, but just this is the definition of, uh, I'm sorry, the word of whatever God it is. The, the action or the definition of that God is the action itself. So, for example, I guess, um, uh, right, say that's a God. And the definition of right is to jot something down. So when you say right, or call out the God name, it's actually the action, it's what you're trying to portray or define. Yeah, I hope you understand what I'm saying there. Hopefully I interpret that correctly. The actual power of the mantras is the power of the gods, which that does not fit 
I, in my opinion, you could say maybe, I don't know, I'm, I'm just, this is weird to say that you invoke the power of gods when you don't believe in God, though. That's kind of um, contradictory. But I, I'm wondering if it meant like, by invoking the mantras, you invoke something similar to the power, uh, similar to what people believe to be the power of God. You invoke your own power, I guess. By doing the mantras, you invoke your own power. I think that may be better in the terms of an atheistic um, belief, because you're not invoking the power of the gods. By acknowledging God, by saying you're invoking their power, you're acknowledging them and obtaining the power from them and not from yourself or something else, I guess, I'm thinking. Let me know. If I'm wrong, let me know. Now let's see what it says about the individual soul. So Mimansa says, there are infinite number of souls. They are eternal, but undergo transmigration due to their karmas, good or bad deeds in a real world. The soul has no consciousness of its own. The consciousness arises in it due to the association with the mind, the sense organ and sense object. This is proved by the absence of consciousness in the deep sleep state. Okay, that is a uh... That is interesting. So, in the soul in this in this form could be seen as Atman or Turiya, because the soul is in the body, conscious of the a soul. I'm assuming in here is is also associated with Turiya. So, therefore, the Turiya. How do I how do I say this? The soul is aware of the waker, the dreamer, and it well and the deep sleep state. This actually kinda makes it a little bit more, um, how do I say, uh, understandable for me. Again, with the dua my duality point of view. Because while I don't know about the soul, there's no way to prove or disprove it in a sense, I'm very questionable of things that are immaterial because, or, yeah, immaterial just because it's very difficult to prove. And the material state is very easy because we can obviously touch something that's material or observe something that's material. Our eyes and senses may not necessarily see the material form of things like x-rays or UV light or whatever other type of light there is <clears throat> just because our organs cannot sense it. But we have um, uh, machines that can detect those things and by that machines detecting it we can observe it. And we have ways of proving things that even our own bodies cannot see. But when you say something is immaterial or is undetectable, that becomes very difficult for me personally to believe. So to say that soul has no consciousness of its own, and if this is Atman that has no consciousness of its own, and only consciousness arises when it's in the body, that can kind of make sense because we have no... We have um, no way of recollecting, say if we are in fact all this one big consciousness, we have no way of recollecting our past lives. Although I will say I watched this one video in Mr. Ballin's YouTube channel that someone supposedly had memories of their past life. I believe it was a, a woman who believed that she was an Egyptian princess maybe or something like that and was able to tell archaeologists certain things that they not discovered yet in this um, place which was which would prove in a sense um, the one being consciousness and that we're just being reborn in these bodies and maybe she recollects her past life but for me it's a little bit easier to understand that while the soul or the Atman itself has no consciousness and only has consciousness when we're in a physical form, our memories and all that, is the reason why we don't remember anything in the past is because the only time we ever remember anything or the only time we have consciousness is when we're in a physical body. That is first time hearing that. That's interesting. Now just to remind you, this concept directly comes from the Nyaya and Vaisheshika philosophy. Now giving mm. the importance of karma. He says that when a person performs the karma, subtle form 
resides in his soul and will give its fruit after the death. Each person must perform daily and occasional duties for the purification of the soul and moral improvement. So let's see what Mimansa says about suffering and liberation. It says that our past karmas are the cause of our suffering and karma is the also way to get rid of suffering when it is performed skillfully. Hmm. And what I meant by skillfully, he defines further that by performing daily and occasionally rituals, it will bring purity of mind, which will help the mind to do selfless action skillfully without attachment. And if suffering is due to the sins committed unwillingly, it can offset by the performance of the various expiratory rites, which is called prashchit. And in present, by not performing desire-motivated actions, will not cause suffering and rebirth. Past actions that has caused this birth is exhausted by experience in this life. So that's the summary of liberation and suffering. Real quick, I'm sorry if I don't make much sense. Again, I'm trying to bring up things from my memory in terms of what I remember and what I believe. I, I don't have time like, oh, I didn't watch his videos prior to script everything out to make sure everything checks out correctly. So hopefully I made sense. <laughs> so now let's see where the Mimansa philosophies practices are still used. So Mimansa systems is used and practiced in following areas even today. All the Vedic duties and rituals, daily duties, ceremonials and rituals of Hindus are governed by Mimansa system. The legal matters such as inheritance, property right, adoption, etc. has a close relationship with Indian law, especially when dealing with Hindus. So that was the Mimansa in the nutshell. Though I have summarized it, compacted it, so the lot of information it cannot cover during the limited time. So now I'm going to move into Vedanta philosophy. Vedanta is called the pinnacle of the Indian philosophy. So what is Vedanta philosophy? I will say it's a school of inquiry. Inquiry about what? inquiry about the absolute truth. So what is Vedanta? As the word says, Vedanta, Veda, Anta. Veda means the knowledge, Anta means the end. So end of the knowledge is called Vedanta. So literally, actually, is the interpretation of all the Upanishads because many Upanishads they gave some conflicting information or ambiguous information about the same reality. So the purpose of the author was to bring them together, make it crystal clear for better understanding that what exactly it means. The author name is called Badarayan, but technically it's another name of Sage Vyasa. The same Sage Vyasa wrote the Mahabharata, the famous Mahabharata through which the Bhagavad Gita came in existence. He also wrote a lot of Puranas. He was, uh, the uh, sage Vyasa is also credited to compiling the Vedas. Veda doesn't have any author, but he is credited as a compiler of Veda. He wrote the text called Brahma Sutra. As the word says, Brahma means the absolute. This philosophy was originally written around 500 BC. Later, lot of masters and scholars, even after thousand years such as Sankara came around 800 AD, was the biggest propounder of Advaita philosophy of Vedanta. So in Vedanta, you will know a little bit later that how many different variations came in. 
there are at least 10 or 11 big scholars out of them at least five major schools came in existence though i will not be able to talk about all the five schools i'm going to pick one but mention the top three which is more highlighted in the, for the general understanding so brahma sutra contains 555 sutras and what is the basis of this philosophy the basis of this philosophy is Upanishads. That's the main source. And Upanishads comes out of Vedas. So let's talk about some basics of Vedanta philosophy. The Brahma Sutra primarily deals with the Brahman or God as the Absolute. It provides coherent philosophy about Brahman from the apparently conflicting statement in the Upanishads or in portions of Vedas and that's the reason why Brahma Sutra was written to clarify those conflicts. Now Brahma Sutra is also known as Vedanta Sutra that's why the Vedanta philosophy came in or also known as Sariraka Sutra, Uttaramimansa Sutra and Bhikshu Sutra or Sutra for renunciates. Brahma Sutra in this text is so iconic that different master interpreted it differently which created over several sub schools but three are the most famous ones. So there are three major sub schools of Vedanta one is the Advaita Vedanta which is <coughs> propounded by Sankara or Shankaracharya. He is also called Adi Shankara. Hmm. His name is, anything can be said about him is too little. In 32 years of his age, that's the life he lived, 32 years. The amount of work he has done is humongous. It is incomprehensible that a person in 32 years can do that. If you get a chance, read about him. He has done work not only on Vedanta, but many other things he has contributed, including Tantra, Bhagavad Gita, on Upanishads. So his Vedanta is basically based on three main sources. One is the 10 major Upanishads, Brahma Sutra which is the core philosophy of <coughs> Vedanta and Bhagavad Gita. These three is called Prasthana Trayi. These three sources are three, three sources and that's how his whole philosophy comes out of it and according to him there is only one reality and that is called Brahman. The rest of the things are part of Maya or illusion. It sounds very interesting, right? So let's little dive into it. So this dude only lived for 32 years and then died? Like he's 32 years old and then died? Or he did work for 32 years and then died? 32 years is pretty young. <clears throat> and here are the three major sub-schools of Vedanta. The first one is called Advait Vedanta. The second one is called Vishisht Advait Vedanta and third one is called Dvait Vedanta. Advait school of Vedanta is considered the superior and the most ancient one which was passed down to Sankara in the lineage of Vyasa. Sankara's teaching are based on three texts. Brahma Sutra, Ten major Upanishads and Bhagavad Gita. Together he called it a text called Prasthani Trayi, where the Upanishads are injective texts, the Brahma Sutras are the logical text, and the Bhagavad Gita is a practical text. 
Now let me talk to you about some of the key terms used in Vedanta philosophy. And here are they. So I'm going to talk about these key terms according to Advaita Vedanta philosophy. Other sub-schools of Vedanta may interpret a little bit differently, but most of them use these key terms. The top one is, the very first one is called Brahman, which is supreme consciousness without any attribute, means it does not have any guna. Remember what I talked in Sankhya, which is called the three guna of Prakriti, Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. So this Brahman does not have any of those guna that's why it's also called nirgun brahman means no guna now the brahman has a inherent power through which it veils itself he hides behind that and that is called maya this is another concept in vedanta that everything what appears to be real but ultimately it is not real is called maya so to relate back to Sankhya, it's like the Prakriti what you see is what in Vedanta is calling Maya. So in cosmic sense, the ignorance is called Maya and the words such as Avidya, Ajnana, Vivarta are the name of the same thing. Adviya. Adnaya, uh oh, sorry. Adnana, Vivarta are the same. Those are all just wait. Constantly sense the ignorance is Maya. So all of those just means ignorance or Maya. Now, third important thing is called Ishvara. Isha means the one who rules. So it's the Brahman with attribute of Maya. That means it's Saguna Brahman. Saguna means with Guna. Who rules the world or you can call it God that is called Ishwara so the fourth one oh. is Atman it's very much same as a Brahman it's a pure consciousness on individual level or soul or spirit to better understand between Brahman and Atman Brahman is like the forest Atman is like the trees of the forest I was going to ask that question. It's like, is Atman and Brahman different? I've always kind of heard them as they're kind of the similar and the same. I was going to pause it here and, and kind of pause the recording so I could actually read this and understand it a little bit better. I want to make a twist to Maya to make it sound like it's, it's the reality that we have even though it's false, but it's something that we know to be real in the physical realm, but not the truth in terms of may be our true being but let's continue on and the fifth one is called jivatman jivatman is made of two words jiva plus atman jiva means the being which is part of the maya having the body breath mind prana etc and plus consciousness which is atman that together is called jivatman I'm going to pause real quick and read that and be right back. Okay, so I took about five, maybe five, maybe between five to ten minutes on this. So, okay, Brahman, supreme consciousness without any attributes. I believe that is the everything in a sense, I believe. Like, uh, everything is Brahman. Maya. This I, I thought about, and hopefully I didn't quite forget too much. So Maya, well, Supreme Conscious without any attributes. I, that I remember as being one of the arguments, uh, I believe one of the seven arguments against non-duality. How can something be everything but have no attributes? Which is kind of the same argument I kind of I came up with here. Next, the Maya. According, at least according to what this person has uh, stated here, inherited power of Brahman to veil itself. So Maya itself is real. I'm not saying that it, it's real in the sense that it's capable of disguising itself. The material world itself is real. We just observe it. Or the world itself is real. Just our, our, observa <laughs> our observation of it is wrong. But it is still real. 
Um, and it's weird for Maya to inherit the power of Brahman if Brahman does not have any attributes what, whatsoever. You cannot inherit nothing. I mean, I guess you can, but it'd be nothing none the same, nonetheless. So, assuming that Brahman does have something that he can inherit, and assuming I misunderstood without any attributes, that still, again, makes Maya still real. Kind of like what Swami's talking about, how you're walking down the street or something, then you look, it's like, oh, a snake! But then when you illuminate it, it's just a rope. While both, uh, while the, the object itself is real, just the interpretation is wrong. So you can touch the rope and it is a physical, real object, not a snake. But again, Maya, I've heard Swami talk about it and I got an understanding of it. I may definitely need to watch more videos of it to get a better understanding of it. I understand it, it, it to be, well, an illusion in a sense. Like, but I guess I need more definition of it so I don't necessarily misinterpret it too much. So it's kind of like this phone. Uh, say, this is a brick. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not a brick. It's a, it's a phone. It's a cell phone. And, and I'll be like, no, 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 it's a brick. That's the illusion. I think this is a brick, but in reality, it's a cell phone. But the point is, is that there is still an object here that is real. What and that the definition or my interpretation of it is wrong. Um, Ishvara, Brahman with attribute of Maya. So this one, when it says personal God, Brahman, I think of kind of like God, but not really. It's it's uh, more along the lines that the way I understood it is the fact that again with the personal God how we think Brahman is we think of it as a, as the different gods in Hinduism or any god in any religion or well I guess God yeah God or gods but the reality is Brahman is the ultimate one and Ishvara are the personal gods that you think is real until you come to the realization that this personal god is not the real god but Brahman is. It's like your step towards Brahman, I believe. Atman, pure consciousness, inherent and essential sense of all beings. Beings, when you say beings, you think of people or things that are alive. It should be a sense of all things because if my if I read correctly some of the comments when I asked is the fact that stones have spirit <laughs> even in that video Richard Dawkins video stone has spirit uh, wood has spirit air has spirit so say all things <sighs> otherwise people Westerners or people who don't understand this will assume things that are alive even maybe more specific to human beings alone so Jivatman, uh, pure consciousness associated with Maya. So this one understood it to be like, like, uh, like I am conscious. This is the real me. I am this. Whereas, because a, a pure consciousness associated with Maya, meaning that you believe that this is you and you're not part of Brahman or Atman. So you, you, there's this illusion that this is you, not uh, Turiya or Atman itself. You're separate from Atman. But uh, the example he gave here, I kind of want to go through that real quick. We're saying Brahman is the forest and Atman are the individual trees, which is, in my, in my understanding of that, is actually Javatman because individual trees would indicate that you're an individual, not part of the not part of the forest. I guess technically you are part of the forest if you're in the forest. Because trees in themselves are separate, a collection of trees, of individual trees make a forest. But I guess it might be, I don't know. So let's go on. So the fourth one is Atman. It's we'll rewind a little very bit. much same as a Brahman. It's the pure consciousness on individual level or soul or spirit. To better understand between Brahman and Atman, Brahman <clears throat> is like the forest, Atman is like the trees of the forest. And the fifth one is called Jivatman. Jivatman is made of two words, Jiva plus Atman. Jiva.
Let me know about my interpretation of Maya. I mean, again, the the main thing that I see that is this the illusion, it's the the ignorance that you know of the world, but the sheer fact that it may be ignorance, but it's still the problem with Maya is the fact that it's still it's still real, but misinterpreted, misinterpreted. Brick. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me do this one. Brick. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> oh, the pen. Love it. So this is a brick. You said, no, 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 that's a pen. No, this is a brick until it's illuminated to, for me to know what, in fact, it is. But the whole point is the fact that it's still a real object, just misinterpreted or misunderstood. Um, and plus, my, the reason, another reason, at least from this one, that the Maya is real is the fact that it inherits the power of Brahman itself. So something... Whenever, I guess in my perspective, when something inherits something, whatever is inheriting it is has to be real. Dua means the being. Maybe I'm just thinking, overly thinking it, maybe. Again, I definitely need to hear more explanation of the Maya. I've only had one video so far, I believe, on that one, which was Swami's. He explained it really well, but I guess all the pieces hasn't quite connected just yet. Which is part of the Maya having the body breath, mind, prana, etc. and plus consciousness which is Atman. That together is called Jivatman. So sixth one is called theory of causation. You may have heard this theory in Sankhya. But Sankhya defines that in one way. Here Advaita Vedanta defines in a different way and that's why this is named differently as Vivartavad. Here, Sankara says that an effect is merely an illusory appearance of reality and that is the cause. So basically he's talking about Maya. Whereas in Sankhya, Kapila talks about Prakriti. Now the seventh one is Prana or the life force. You may have heard about word Prana in Yoga, especially in Tantra. The vibration of Prana is at the root cause of entire universe. This is what Vedanta says. And it is the prime cause of all events occurring in creation. Prana is not different than Maya, but is the cosmic life force, breath of the ultimate reality. And the eighth one, which I have included here, is called Mahavakya. And this is also the four stages of self-realization. And it basically says that there is only one reality. Like in other philosophies, you heard 16, 7, 3, 2, and this finally, one reality. And that is, Brahman alone is real and <coughs> universe is unreal. There is only one Brahman without a second. This self is Brahman or I am Brahman. And finally, the entire universe is Brahman. Okay, this is kind of contradictory from one of my understanding of this. Let me turn off CC real quick. So, Brahman alone is real. The universe is unreal. The entire universe is Brahman. What? So, basically, you're saying the entire universe is Brahman, but yet the universe is unreal. Brahman and the universe are the same, but the universe is unreal, but Brahman is real. That's contradictory according, well, I mean, as far as I'm understanding. And then that would eliminate Maya as well, then. I'm alone is real. The entire universe is Brahman. If everything is Brahman, that means everything is real, and colluding this brick is real, this brick is real, which is what I was saying. Again, just I'm saying that even though I say this is a brick and reality is a pen, the item itself is real, just my understanding of it is wrong. But Maya can't be into this if everything is Brahman, Brahman alone is real. There's only one Brahman without a second. Okay, okay, I understand. That's understandable. The self is Brahman. I am Brahman. Okay. Again, I can two and three don't conflict anything for me. 
but one in four conflicts in my mind. Maybe, maybe what it's trying to say, or at least as far as for me to rationalize this, is that while Brahma alone is real, and what we believe the universe to be something separate from Brahman is not real. And the entire universe itself is a Brahman. So what we think the universe is, is actually false. But the entire universe is Brahman. It's just to say that you think the universe is not Brahman, therefore it's false, but the entire universe is Brahman and is also real. I don't know, that just... Let me know, how am I not understanding this? Or am I actually making some sense? So oh. that's the whole concept of Advaita Vedanta. Now let me talk to you about some of the key names used in Vedanta. <clears throat> they can be very confusing. When I was a teenager, I happened to read a book written by Swami Vivekananda on Vedanta. And I was... Sorry, that's the Swami. I think so, right? Vive, Vivekananda? No, never mind. I think he follows him though. Sorry Studying <laughs> the difference between Atman and Paramatma. And that was so confusing at that time. Though it was written in my own native language, Hindi, but I could not understand what it is. So today, with a little bit more understanding, it's my attempt to explain so that any of you have a confusion can have a better understanding. Though I must say that there are different scholars and masters in Vedanta philosophy, the same term they can interpret slightly differently. So here is my attempt, you can see. So as you can see, the whole box is divided in four parts though the whole box itself is the Brahman or the Absolute. Now how these names are used and how it is related to. So on the top level which is on cosmic or macro level on the bottom it is on individual or micro level. On the left side it is without any attributes or it is not in touch with Maya on the right side it is with attributes or with Maya so on the top level on the left if you see there are several names of Brahman it's called Brahm, Brahman, Nirguna Brahman, Para or Param Brahman, Paramatma means Supreme Atma, Purushottama or Supreme Soul this whole section is impersonal God and it's only one so now if you color that Brahman with Maya now see the reflection on the right side that is what we call God and the names are Apara Brahman, Ishvara which means Lord or Ruler Saguna Brahman means the Brahman with Guna. Hiranyagarbha is also mentioned an aspect of the God in Vedas. And God itself in the English. Now the word Bhagwan have used because it's not Vedic name. But a lot of people use this to clear the confusion that well Bhagwan fits in. So names such as Bhagwati and Bhagwat is also derived from Bhagwan means one Bhagwati signifies the feminine aspect and Bhagwat signifies the male aspect of Sagun Brahman. Now let's go to the bottom one. So on the individual level if you see on the left side the words used as Atman, Atma or Self individual purusha soul or a spirit also used as chaitanya or chit this is all individual consciousness without any attribute in vedanta now they are many in nature same way as i said the top one is like a big forest the bottom is like the trees 
Now when you look on the right side, when it comes in contact with Maya, here Jiva, Jivatma, Prani, the one who has Prana. This is all living being like which has who have body, mind, breath. When it comes in contact with the Atma or on the left side, this is what we become a living being. And these are the different names of Brahman and a different aspect. So usually it's called that Brahman has three stages like one you see without attribute, with attribute, and the bottom one is called together. So, it's also you might have heard Sachitananda Param Brahma Purushottam Paramatama Sri Bhagavati Sameta Sri Bhagavate Namaha. It's all the names included in just one line. So the absolute Brahman is the true self, pure bliss, and supreme soul. Sat Chit Anand. That's what the Brahman is all about. It's only one reality. It manifests in different, different form depending on how you look and how you interpret. So I hope this clarified some of the names if you have ever heard and if it got any confusion from it. So now let's see what Vedanta says about creation of the world. Now these answers are not just from one school but kind of commonly what they answer from all the schools. So Vedanta school holds that without the guidance of conscious principle, unconscious matter could not produce this world which adheres to certain rules and laws. It discards the theory of creation of Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Sankhya and Yoga. Because if you remember, Sankhya is the biggest opposing principle when Vedanta was getting written down. Because that was the one of the oldest philosophy. And Sankhya says that its Prakriti, which is an unconscious principle, is the mother of whole creation. Now the second one it says that Brahman is both the material and the efficient cause of this world. From Brahman this world came into existence in whom it inheres and to whom it returns at the end of the cycle of creation. The third one is Brahman evolves himself into ether, air, fire, water, earth and other by will and associated with every stage of creation up to the last. And the last one it says, since it is Brahman that has evolved into this world, this world is not different from than Brahman. So now let's see what it says about the Creator. The Vedanta schools agrees on the existence of God, but it says that the existence of God cannot be proved or known by reasoning and logic alone. And that is very difficult for me to believe. Just because, again, um, if someone were to, it's kind of, uh, let me just go ahead and explain this part. So it's kind of like if someone were to say, this exists, but it cannot be proven or known by reasoning and logic alone. Oh, reasoning and logic alone. Okay, well, I definitely got to hear more. What, what else? There's, there's a way to be proven, but not by reason or logic. That is kind of weird still, though. <laughs> you, it's yeah. By reason and logic alone. That is... Uh... Oh, wait, wait. Can it be proven or known by reason and logic alone? Oh, yeah, alone. You have to have more than just reason and logic to be able to prove that God exists. That is, that is, that is the problem for me. Again, anyone can say anything and say, well, it cannot be proven by le reason or logic. <clears throat> you know, that's, again, like most religions out there where uh, how it all started was, I guess, at least in terms of, you know, Europe. 
is that you know uh, was it the Greek or Roman god started off in Mount Olympus? It's like oh, and then they finally climb Mount Olympus. It's like oh no no no, they're in the clouds now. And now that we're flying in the clouds, oh no no no, they're in not quite space, but in the other dimension. It's just like they keep pushing it back and back until we're already ca- we're, we're to the point where we cannot reach it. It's like oh no no, it's a uh, immaterial, it cannot be measured, you cannot see it, but it's everywhere. And it's like. You know, you're just pushing it back. You're you're trying to get it to the point where there's no way to find it, and whenever we cannot, we, there's no way to find it. They say that's where it's at, kind of deal, and that's that's a problem in my opinion, just because it's it's, I don't know, just it has to be. If you cannot experience it within logic, logic and reasoning, it is kind of difficult for me to believe. Second, the God's existence can be established only through direct experience or by testimony. And testimony here means it refers to Vedas or Shruti. So the reason for the reference is that's the place you can justify your faith and to understand the real teachings. And it can remove all the doubts. Goddesses can be established only through direct experience or by testimony. Reasoning is, however, necessary to justify faith. Reasoning is, however, necessary to justify faith and to understand their real teachings and to remove all doubt. That is very difficult, again, because direct experience, because, again, our sense, uh, which I do agree with Sadhguru here, is our sense organs aren't exactly uh, up to par, necessarily. We sometimes see things in the corner of our, of our eyes. Sometimes we hear things. Sometimes we imagine things. Um, and like, for example, if I, if I hear something, I'm like, did I just hear something, or did I really hear something? It's like, hey, uh, did you hear something? You did? Oh, so I wasn't just hearing. Oh, we need to go take a look at that or run away to verify that in fact that it did in fact happen. Again, two people could have just imagined hearing things for some weird reason. It's highly unlikely, though. But, um, but again, that's the reason why it's a little bit difficult for personal experience. Now, if you want to personally believe in this and you don't enforce it on anyone else, perfectly fine in my opinion. By all means, if it makes you a better person, then please do. Um, and if someone wants to know about your personal God, then please talk to them about it. Absolutely. But I cannot (laughs) it's just very difficult for me to acknowledge something existing through personal experience because again our sense organs are not always infallible and also they did an experiment where you know something happened and five minutes later they talked to everyone and asked them what happened and like you know the the details of the scenario and they they themselves all come up with different kinds of things. So that proves that our sense organs are not our memory. It's not quite good. We don't remember things quite right. <laughs> so that. So lastly, the two names used for God, one as an impersonal and transcendent aspect of Supreme, that is called Brahman. The other one is the personal God as the ultimate reality and the ruler of the world which is called Ishwara, which has attributes, comes with Maya. So now let's see what Vedanta says about individual soul. The individual souls or Atman or the self are also Brahman. The self is hidden behind the five seats comprising three bodies. The five seats are physical, energy, mental, wisdom and bliss it's like five layers and these also create three bodies gross subtle and casual so the physical is like the gross level the next three is subtle and the last one the bliss is the casual I definitely need a better understanding of that why is it what's why is it called gross like nasty or something else subtile energy mental and wisdom okay maybe I can understand but casual bliss 
I'm sure these things have deeper meaning, but I don't know what that deeper meaning is. I guess physical body because it's all just meat and blood and nasty stuff. Subtile because energy, your mental and your wisdom are not exactly something that you can measure without... Well, I guess energy you can maybe measure. Mental and wisdom have some form of measurement, but not kind of not really casual does it mean like uh when you get to the point of bliss it's just you're not even trying maybe and the human life is made of four components individual soul or atman mind prana or life force and the body which is made of five elements now atman with ignorance or maya is called jivatman and jiva or jivatman is subject to suffer or enjoy according to the law of karma now let's see what vedanta says about liberation and suffering so pain and pleasure the jiva or jivatma receives according to their karma as you heard in the last slide in Vedanta, liberation means to cast away the veils of ignorance or maya and realize one's essence through Jnana Yoga or Yoga of Knowledge, that I am Brahman. The knowledge and the experience of Brahman leads to freedom from suffering and transmigration or rebirth, which is called moksha. And Vedanta provides a systematic method of spiritual practice which helps to gain release from self-created imaginary bondage of suffering. And then I'm going to talk about the practices of Vedanta. So this is a threefold practice. You have seen it before. This is a practice of Jnana Yoga. The first one is listening and understanding spiritual knowledge, which is called Sarvana focus on understanding the essential nature of self and the second step is reflecting on gain knowledge and establishing the firmness in mind which is called manana in Sanskrit by repeatedly analyzing the concept of Brahman third is contemplate and meditate on the self based on reflections and that is called Nididhyasana Listen and understand spiritual knowledge. Focus on understanding the, the essential nature of the self. Reflect on gaining knowledge and establish the firmness in mind. Repeat analysis to concept. Analysis to concept. Analyze the concept. Why am I saying analysis? And that goes to my mind again. <laughs> Contemplating and meditating on self based on the reflections. Apply the truth in daily life and must maintain a lifestyle in which true consciousness is maintained. Well, I definitely agree on listening and understanding, whether that be spiritual knowledge or otherwise. Reflecting on gaining knowledge and standing firm, this in the mind, again, completely agree. It's the reason why, why I'm saying I want to learn a little bit more about the Maya, because there's still a lot more things I probably don't understand about, so I want to listen and understand it more before I, st and I, even with, even if I know very little of it, I still want to reflect on it as much as possible because when I watch future videos, what I reflected on can get answered right away or can be reaffirmed and I don't have to wait until I know so many things to reflect on it because I already have all of that reflection pre-stored or already have it in the mind. Contemplate and meditate on self based on reflections. Find the truth in daily life, which I agree. Um, don't want to be lying, and you want to live to true to life. Want to be living in the truth. You want to be telling the truth. You want to try to be truthful in life, in lifestyle which true consciousness maintain. By applying the truth in daily life, and must maintain a lifestyle in which true consciousness is maintained. It's a beautiful line. In Upanishad says that Om is the bow, individual self is the arrow, and Brahman is the target. So one should shoot carefully so that one should get fully absorbed in Brahman consciousness. 
In Vedanta, some of the practices such as contemplation, one of the examples that I can give you is called vichara. There are steps to do the vichara and there are different meditation techniques which are introduced. So depending on what you might be looking for, these tools and techniques can be applied. Also in Vedanta, just to give you an idea that the duality which we talked in Sankhya philosophy is fully merged into Vedanta in a very interesting way. Because when Vedanta was there, the only biggest opponent philosophy was Sankhya. And in order to prove your own philosophy as the supreme, you have to give some of the reasoning to defeat or refute the other philosophy and which was at that time Sankhya. Here, if you talk about Advaita Vedanta, when Sankara says Brahma Satya Jagata Mithya means the Brahma is the truth, everything is false. So now let's talk about the differences and similarity between Mimansa and Vedanta philosophy. I made a face earlier, I was realizing that I'm over an hour and then the face with that noise sound, I'm very familiar with the train problem in recordings. So as you can see Mimansa and Vedanta take two divergent ways. At the same time as you know that the author of Mimansa was a student of the author of Vedanta. And even the author of Vedanta's sage Vyasa has referred many times about Gemini in his uh, work or Brahma Sutra. Brahma Sutra is also known as Vedanta Sutra. So there is hardly any kind of similarity but except few. So I'm going to talk about some differences and similarity just to keep the consistency of the framework I am trying to focus on. So let's see the differences first. Mimansa focuses on rituals, worship, right action or dharma through karma. But Vedanta rejects the rituals and focuses on knowledge or jnana for liberation. Mimansa says our karma is the cause for suffering. And Vedanta says our ignorance is the cause for all sufferings. Mimansa focuses earlier portion of Vedas, which I talked about earlier. And Vedanta focuses on the latter portion of the Veda or towards the end of the Vedas, mainly the Upanishads. The original Mimansa philosophy does not accept the existence of God, but the Vedanta accepts God and says everything is Brahman. <clears throat> and I completely agree with ignorance the causing of false suffering. This is the reason why I always say try to understand. Always try to understand. I guess that's in a, another way of saying obtain knowledge. Obtain knowledge of what you're trying to understand <laughs> so that you don't suffer very much. Because if you understand what's going on, you know what to do. You know what you can and cannot do. And if you can't do it, the two things I say, if you can't do anything about it, then there's nothing to worry about. I mean, you just have to take it, I guess. <laughs> there's going to be suffering, I suppose. But if, if you get to the point where it's like, well, there's nothing I can do. So there's worrying, is it going to help it? If you can do something about it, then there's two things you can do. You can either do something about it or don't do anything about it. If you don't do anything about it, then you, well, you better accept the consequences of not doing anything about it. And by making that choice, you have to understand that you shouldn't, I guess, worry or suffer for it because you've chosen to do that and you have to take the consequences. If you do something about it, then guess what? You're going to do something about it. And again, don't worry because you're going to do something about it. You just got to figure out what that is. So finally, let's look about the similarities between Mimansa and Vedanta philosophy, which is hardly very few. So the foundation for both Mimansa and Vedanta philosophy are the Vedas. That's the biggest common ground. Both accepts it as true and highest source of knowledge. Both Mimansa and Vedanta provides correct interpretation of the Vedas 
in their respective area to eliminate any confusion about the same across different scriptures. But one focuses on karma side of it through rituals, the other focuses on the knowledge side of it. Both accepts the law of karma and also provides the solution to get rid of the suffering. So finally, here is a summary of all the six schools of philosophy. Out of these six, Sankhya, Yoga and Vedanta is still the dominant philosophy today. Oh, got to go back. I definitely got to look at that. So finally, here is a summary of all the six schools of philosophy. Out of these six, Sankhya, Yoga and Vedanta Okay, that's what I wanted to hear. Sankhya, Yoga, and Vedanta. Oh, so Mimas, Mimamsa, then quite a number of sutras. Yoga. Man, 2,500 uh, 2, sutras. Whew. Real, reality of the world. 16 realities of the world. 7, 2, 1. Duality. Yoga is 3? That like triality? Vedanta one. Oh, does God exist? Yes, yes. Some can no. Thought Mimamsa had two uh, variation. One in fact did later on, and one still didn't. Vedanta. I thought Vedanta also had two, which was oh god, I, the the Vata. I'm sure, I mispronounced that. The Vieta. I think that might be a little bit more correct. Causes suffering, ignorance, ignorance, ignorance. Mind? Mind, ignorance, kind of same, maybe? Karma and ignorance. I agree with the ignorance portion. God exists, no one, yes. I believe more in the no section. Uh, focus practice. Yoga, yoga, yoga. Raja yoga, karma yoga. Oh, that's pretty cool. So, Raja yoga and Jnana yoga. Proximate time. So higher, oh, Samkhya is older, huh? And Yoga is the younger one. Vedanta is the middle child of the surviving ones, huh? Well, it's kind of the middle of all of them, too. Vedanta is still the dominant philosophy today. Samkhya. So one way if you see the Prakriti and Purusha, the dualistic philosophy in Sankhya, is very similar to what the Dvaita Vedanta says about Brahman and Maya. Everything what Prakriti does, he takes the whole thing and puts into the Maya. The whole creation goes into the Maya. Ajnana, the Aviveka, everything goes into the Maya. So this is a kind of little bit tidbit I'm giving you. That though these philosophies are diverse and different from each other, but how they are combined and connected to each other. I hope this was useful for you. So I hope you enjoyed. And if you like, please do feel free to comment, share, and subscribe. Thanks again. Have a wonderful day. Namaste. Please, please, if you enjoy this stuff, please go to his channel. Right there is the, the title. Up and also in his videos, I have the link to the video I was reacting to. I don't know if I'm going to do any more of his because I don't want to take too much of his content. But if you want to watch all of his stuff, please go to his channel. There will be a link below or look up the channel name. And this was very interesting. I definitely got to look at uh, Samkhya. Skampia, yeah, philosophy. I definitely want to look into that one. And I want to look more into the Vid uh, uh, Vedanta as well. Because that is what Swami talks about. And he's an amazing teacher. Clearly, he was a teacher for a long time. Because he explained things so well. He repeats a lot of the stuff, but that's too... Because people don't remember if you say it once. So having to repeat it a couple of times will help you remember. Because I remember a lot of what he says. So anyways, that is my reaction to what is... Mimamsa and Vedanta. I got a question for y'all, for those of y'all who wants to answer anyway. Which one do you associate with the most? Based on what he says. So far for me, it's Samkhya, actually. 
Again, because of the no god and the duality of the world. So far, that is the easiest to, in a sense, prove that the fact that I am me and everyone else, and then there's everyone else and everything else. But anyways, let me know in the comments below. Anyways, if you like my uh, content, please consider subscribing. Thumbs up, thumbs down, down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next vid.